Erev Tov, and good evening, and almost Chag Sameach. As you all know, we'll be celebrating Israel's 73rd anniversary of its independence this coming Wednesday. On behalf of St. Louis Friends of Israel and Kol Rina, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's presentation and dialogue. This is part of our community Zionism 3.0 series. So I hope we can engage in a question and answer period after the presentation. My name is Bob Olshan. I'm the Israel Chair for Kol Rina Congregation, as well as the Treasurer for St. Louis Friends of Israel, and I represent Amenu St. Louis. We would like to thank all of our promotional sponsors for their participation. I'd like to now uh, very briefly introduce you the co-presidents of St. Louis Friends of Israel, Galit Lev Harir and Tracy Goldstein to welcome you. Hi, I'm Galit Lev Harir. I'm the co-president of St. Louis Friends of Israel and the St. Louis Council representative for the Israeli American Council, the IAC. We thank all of our promotional partners and all of you for attending this event. And hi, I'm Tracy Goldstein the other co-president and co-founder of St. Louis Friends of Israel. We are getting very excited in St. Louis for what will be an exciting week of celebration surrounding Yom Ha'atzma'ut. In St. Louis on Thursday night, there will be a drive-in community event at the Jewish Community Center. If you look in the chat section of, um, the, of your Zoom screen, you will find the link to this event. We hope Everybody can come out, but you must be registered to attend the 73rd birthday party of Eretz Israel. Thank you, and back to you, Bob. Thank you both. It is my distinct pleasure now to introduce Dr. Eli Reddick. Let's, Dr. Eli Reddick, there we are, hi, Eli. Um, Dr. Eli Reddig is the Israel Institute Teaching Fellow in the Department of Jewish, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. He is also a researcher at the Maritime Policy and Strategy Research Center in the University of Haifa. Prior to these appointments, Dr. Reddig was a visiting scholar in the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies at George Washington University and a Neubauer Fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv University. He was also a lecturer at New York University and at Rice University in Houston. Dr. Reddick's research focuses on patterns of conflict and cooperation over shared energy resources and environmental threats in Israel's foreign policy. He has published his research in numerous prestigious journals he has also contributes regularly to Israeli and international media outlets on issues pertaining to Israel's energy security and has testified twice before the Israeli parliament on energy security matters. His courses at Washington University in St. Louis include Israel's foreign policy, international energy politics, energy governance in Israel and the Middle East and democracies and dictatorships in the Middle East. I had the fortune of auditing uh, one of his classes on Israel's foreign policies right before the outbreak of COVID. In talking with a number of his students there, he is one of their favorite lecturers. I'm glad to say we have two of his students who will be asking some questions following the talk. Please put your questions in the questions and answer and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Dr. Reddick has also given a number of engaging lectures sponsored by the Jewish Federation and everyone has loved them. So I'm sure you will all enjoy hearing Eli's lecture tonight. Eli. Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming and thank you Bob for organizing this great event. Thank you to the Atlanta Israel Coalition and to the Friends of St. Louis um, and uh, to Galit and to Tracy and to uh, everyone. Tracy, you can uh, come here if you want. Bob, we can, we, oh, we can still hear you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for uh, all for coming. Um, the talk, uh, and th thank you for all the compliments, Bob. It's been uh, a great experience talking before the St. Louis community. 
uh, and it's been a great experience teaching at the Washington University. And I understand now that uh, the talk is a little um, more expanded. We have visitors from Atlanta and from other places uh, across the US. Um, so I want to kind of give a few disclaimers because a lot of you have heard me speak a, a lot of times and they already know this about me, but some of you are new. So I want to give a, a few disclaimers. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk for the next 40 minutes about uh, US-Israel relations in the Middle East, in a new Middle East, and how the new Middle East has affected this relations. Um, but uh, I do not, in my talks, give opinions. I, I won't advocate a certain um, uh, side. I won't say that one side is right or one side is wrong. Uh, I will try as much as possible to be objective, to be even-handed, to give you information so you can judge uh, yourself. If by the end of the talk, you can guess where I am in the Israeli political map, then I haven't done my job properly, okay? So the whole idea is not to give, um, kind of lead you to a path, but to show you complexity. And if by the end of the talk, you think um, you know the answer to these problems, then again, I haven't done my uh, uh, job properly. So I'm here to show you uh, complexity, okay? Now the talk is, uh, has a bunch of, uh, or a few levels to it. One is a new Middle East. And what does that mean? What are, I, I'm going to start from the macro and then go uh, down. So I'm going to start with what are the US interests in the Middle East and how does Israel fit within these interests? Then I'm going to talk about Israeli elections and, um, uh, sorry, I got the chat, the chat is not for me. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the Israeli elections and what does that mean? And then I'm going to go into the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, okay? And again, I will not end with the answer. I will end with uh, complexity and then leave it to uh, questions from the audience. And then of course, from uh, Eli and Philip uh, who agreed to come and thank you for that. So let's start. And again, if you know me, you know that I always uh, share presentations uh, and I always have that uh, blue and white uh, background. So we, you hear a lot of analysis and I, and I really, I wanna be original here because I'm sure that if you've, you've probably been into a lot of these talks and, and um, you've already read a lot about the Biden administration and how it uh, will uh, uh, treat Israel or the, or the Netanyahu administration. Um, and often what you will hear is that it is not a priority currently that definitely the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not a priority for the Biden administration. And generally speaking, the whole uh, relations with Israel is currently not a top priority for Biden. It is more about internal issues. It is more about uh, other uh, problems uh, and, um, that it has. Um, more than that, there's also kind of a, a feeling that the US not only is Israel is not a priority for the US currently, but the Middle East, is not that much of a priority. A lot of it has to do with this feeling that um, the Middle East isn't as important as it was before. So I want to kind of break a myth here. I want to break several myths and talk about why the Middle East is still very important for the US, why it is going to only increase in its importance to the US, and why Israel has a role to play in each one of these interests. And for that, I need to explain this map. Because whether we want to or not, the US what, uh, this is, this is um, a map of the uh, choke points in, in uh, the Middle East and uh, the amount of barrels of oil that go through these major choke points. Because whether or not uh, the US wants uh, and whether it, doesn't, whether it uh, is excited to or not, it can't leave the Middle East. If it does leave the Middle East, then the Middle East will come to it. And a great way to show this is through this map. And I want to explain this map because uh, it, it's almost a cliche to talk about the Middle East as uh, through the prisms of oil, right? Why, why are we still doing that? The US, A, has a lot of oil now because of the shill industry, and B, we're moving away from oil. It's not, right, uh, we're, we're using less and less of it, and we're moving to renewables, and it's not going to be a major priority. So first, I need to understand. Uh, I, I need to break one myth and uh, explain that uh, oil is not going anywhere, and because of this, the Middle East is not going anywhere in uh, U.S. priorities. Um, because 
Today, when we look at the global energy supply, and again, I'm, a, I'm an energy researcher, so I can't uh, start a talk without this, and I apologize for those that already hear, heard this 10-minute spiel that I'm going to give, our world runs on fossil fuels, mainly on oil. I know you hear all about wind and solar and geothermal and uh, wave energy and, and uh, ethanol, et cetera, but the world needs uh, fossil fuels. 81% of the energy in the world is still fossil fuels. The main uh, part is oil. Uh, the rest, right, is nuclear, hydro, and biofuels and waste is a nice way of saying burning wood and animal dung in, your, in third world countries to heat up your house. All of the things that you hear in the news, all of the solar and renewables and the transition, et cetera, that's 2.0%. That's, it doesn't, it's not even enough to get its own part of the, of the chart. Now, this is surprising to us because we think we're, we're moving away from oil. And the reason we think that is because when we think about energy, we think about electricity. And also we only think about the US. But uh, electricity, there are two problems with this, with this idea. One is that oil isn't used for electricity. Uh, the only place where we use oil for electricity is uh, in the Middle East, where oil is very, very cheap in certain parts, and in small island states like Hawaii or Malta or Cyprus, where it's uh, easiest to transport and takes the least room. Uh, so they use oil for electricity generation. But oil is less than 3% of electricity generation. So even if we move our entire planet to generate electricity just from solar or wind, which is currently technically not possible and, and we don't have enough rare earth materials, but assuming we can do this, that will not affect our need for oil because oil doesn't use electricity. Electricity is just 20% of why we use energy. Most of the energy we're using around the world is not for electricity. And so even if we move our entire uh, market, uh, our entire electricity sector all around the world to renewables, that A, uh, it does not affect 80% of why we use energy, and B, that doesn't affect oil at all. It's not why we use oil. We don't use it for electricity, and it's not relevant. The whole decarbonization talk is not relevant to our dependency on oil. And so what do we use oil for? If it's the main source of, uh, of, of, of energy, but it's not for electricity. So we say, okay, it's, it's electric cars. If we we're currently moving to electric cars, and so slowly, we will not need to use oil anymore. And again, that is a myth because the main driver for oil is not uh, cars. So even if theoretically we move all of our cars around the world to electricity, right? Assuming that electricity will come from clean sources, but let's say it is, and all of our personal cars move to, uh, to be electric cars, let's say by 2030, again, it's not theoretically, technically it's not possible, but let's say we do the, the impossible and, and do that that will decrease our need for oil by about 7%. Because our, our main need for oil is not from personal cars and it's not from electricity. Oil is everywhere. Look around you in your room, look around you, uh, uh, look out the window. Everything that you have has oil in it. Whether the oil is an ingredient in the product itself, whether it's in plastic and rubber, whether it's in the computer that I'm talking through, whether it's in uh, the glasses on your face or the makeup that you put on your face or, or the medicine that you take, whether it's in the asphalt or in cleaning products, whether it's the concrete in front of you and the wall in front of you, the suit, the binding material in the concrete, all has oil in it, right? When, Biden, when the Biden administration talks about a $2 trillion plan to uh, rebuild the infrastructure in the US, that means a lot of oil is going to be needed because all of this concrete and all of this asphalt and all of this roads has oil in the ingredients. Even if oil is not an ingredient in the product itself, everything around you, everything that you've ever encountered, every food that you've ever eaten, every product that you ever bought or saw, unless it's a carrot that you grew in your backyard, and even then if you use fertilizer, then that's oil, every product that you've ever consumed was brought to you by either a truck or a plane or a ship or a train. And sometimes all of these things combined. And so we don't have a solution for most of these issues. We don't have a replacement for oil for all of these products that we live with. And we don't have a replacement for oil for most of the trade that we have from how the product actually gets to us. 
right? We may have an uh, electric solution for trains. It will take a lot of time to do this, maybe for trucks, but again, it will take very big batteries and, and it will take time to do this. We don't have a non-fossil solution currently for ships and planes, and that's where main, that's where most of the uh, uh, trade comes from and most of the products that we use come from. We often think about the US as, right, uh, we talk about, but cars are about 19% of the oil that we use in the US. Uh, yes, but all of our products, uh, even if it doesn't come to the US, it comes to, uh, to China, and China uses that oil to create products that are shipped to us. So the oil isn't technically used in the US, but we're depending on that oil for the product to be made and to be shipped to us. So the US is very, very dependent on oil and so is the entire world. Everything around us has oil in it. And of course, I just talked, I only talked about products right now and the economy. We also can't have a war without oil. It doesn't matter how big your ships are. It doesn't matter how big your tanks are. It doesn't matter how many missiles or jet fighters you have. If you don't have a regular, constant, reliable, cheap supply of oil, you cannot exercise your military might. Oil is an enabler of not just industrial and economic power, but of military power. If you want to be a hegemon, if you want to be a major power in the world, you must have regular access to oil. Oil is all around us. Now, there, there are three reasons why I'm giving you this spiel why, and why I'm starting with it. A, because it's going to be very hard to stop our addiction to oil. B, is because if oil is expensive, that means that everything is expensive. If something happens to a major oil exporting country that takes out oil from the market, if something happens in a bottleneck like the Straits of Hormuz or the Straits of Malacca or the Suez Canal that takes out oil from the market, then everything becomes expensive. And so if something happens in a major oil exporting country or reason, it's everyone's business. Because if oil prices go up, everything goes up the product, the manufacturing, the shipping, right? Even if I don't use that oil, even if I don't need Saudi Arabian oil, but China needs that oil and China makes the products and then ships it to me, then if oil becomes scant and if oil becomes more expensive then the products become more expensive in the shipping and then things are more expensive for me, whether I'm using that oil or not. Because oil is a global product and it's in absolutely every product that we have whether in the shipping, whether in manufacturing, it's somewhere in the process. And the price of oil is important for, our, for the very basics of our economy, okay? And this is why this map is so important because most of this oil is coming from one region. And the major bottlenecks that can potentially interrupt the flow and the, and, and the very existence of a modern economy is in the Middle East. And so the U.S., whether it wants to or not, needs this region to be peaceful or at least stable, right, or, or, or as, as much as possible. It needs allies there, and it needs to make sure that wherever, whatever revisionist country is trying to gain control in that area will not be able to, will be blocked by either your allies or enemies of enemies. You need to make sure that you have control over what's going on there. And of everything, and, and when you, we talk about oil, we talk about the Middle East, and especially this area over here, the Gulf states. 95 million barrels of oil are produced daily in 2019. Um, today, this year, despite COVID, it has gone up to 97 million. And the prediction is that every year until two, 2025, it will go up by a million barrels of oil every day. So 98 million next year, every day of barrels of oil being produced, the year after that 99, the year after that 100. In 2025, it'll reach a plateau. Now 23, a quarter of the, of the oil that is produced is produced in the Gulf region. Out of these, right, 52 out of the 95 million barrels that are produced, 52 are exported. The rest are consumed locally by the countries that produce it. Of that, a third, is exported from the Gulf because most of the oil that the Gulf export uh, produces, they don't consume. They don't have a lot of population, they export. Most of the uh, oil that the US produces, it, it consumes for its own needs. So it controls a quarter of the uh, daily oil production, a third of the daily oil exports, 
and more than half of the global oil reserves in the future. Now we say, okay, by 2025, until then, we're only going to increase our need for oil. Even with COVID, we, we expected COVID to take that down. Not, uh, uh, it has bounced back even bigger than what we thought uh, 2021 will look like. So when it comes to oil uh, production, COVID is, it's as if it's over. It, it's as if it's never happened. But we say, okay, by 2025, we will reach a plateau. We will have more electric cars, demand, uh, will either plateau or go down from there on. And eventually, yes, it will take time. We will need uh, other technologies, maybe we will, maybe hydrogen, et cetera. But eventually we will stop using as much oil. It will be just for the petrochemicals, for the plastics, for the rubber, uh, maybe for the ships, but everything else uh, won't uh, use oil and we will use much less of it. We will still need it because all of our products will be there and the ships will need it but we, don't, we won't need it as much. And so we say, okay, so the Middle East will not be as important. It's important to understand that in such a scenario, the Middle East will, even, will be even more important. As we consume less oil, the Gulf region and the Middle East will be responsible for more of the oil that we use. The reason for that is as we consume less oil, as we will demand less oil, as we will decarbonize and move to electric vehicles and move to other solutions, then we will demand less oil and the price of oil will go down. That means that countries that produce oil uh, in expensive ways, unconventional oil, oil in the deep sea, fracking, for example, in the US, or oil in the deep sea, like in Norway, or tar sands, like in Canada, or heavy oil, like they do in Venezuela, those will stop producing oil. Because as, oil, as demand will go down and the prices will go down, these businesses won't make a profit anymore. Having said that, the Gulf states, the Middle East, will be the last man standing because they have the cheapest, most easily accessible oil in the world. Saudi Arabia can still produce oil at about $10 per barrel and still make a profit. And so as we, as the price of oil go down and the demand goes down, we will still need oil for products. But most of that oil will come from the Middle East while the rest of the oil producers around the world will go out of business. And so the Middle East will only increase its uh, importance as our main source of oil. That means that as we currently see, right, the numbers here, these numbers will only increase because all of these areas of production will stop and, and most of the oil will come from here. Now, this is very important because the US needs to make sure that these areas are stable, that the bottlenecks, that the bottlenecks are, uh, uh, there is no interference. Right, we saw in the Suez Canal a few weeks ago what happens if a ship gets stuck by accident and how much it costs the world economy uh, to recuperate from this. But this was just a silly mistake. If it is done for political reasons, right, definitely the Straits of Hormuz or in the Straits of Malacca or in the Bab al-Mandeb, then that is a huge blow for the world economy, one that is hard to recover from. So the US needs to make sure that this area is stable. Now, how does that come into play? There are a number of areas here that the US needs to take care of. One, for example, is the Suez Canal, right? We, we, we saw what happens if, if it gets stuck. For that, the US needs to make sure that Egypt is a stable country, that its economy is doing well, that it doesn't go to war, for example, with Israel, right? So we have an interest to have it making it strong and stable. We are so interested in having uh, Egypt as our ally and to, as a way to control what it's doing, as a way to keep it stable and to, in order to help its economy, that when uh, its elected president, uh, Mulsi, was toppled in a military coup, then the US refused to recognize it as a military coup. Because if it would, then that technically, according to the peace agreements in, 1970, in 1979 with Israel, uh, if there is a military coup, then the US needs to, by, by law, stop military and foreign aid to Egypt. So the US, didn't call it a military coup, although it was, right? And so the US needs to make sure that everything there is stable. Uh, one issue that Israel that is now creating a major headache for the US is uh, a conflict, a growing conflict between Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. Ethiopia wants to build a hydroelectric dam down here in the Nile, right? Where the Nile starts from. It wants to do that because it's need, it needs electricity and the hydroelectric dam can create a lot of electricity for it. We tend to think about hydro as a, a green energy. And, and it's true that hydro is a renewable energy, 
but it's definitely not green. Because where you build hydro dams, you're creating major environmental impacts, one of them being that Egypt and Sudan will not get as much water as they did before. And so Egypt and Sudan are very furious on Ethiopia and want to make it stop, and Ethiopia is unwilling to. The dam has already been built, or almost being built, the Renaissance Dam. And that creates a huge source of conflict, because if that dam is, is done, then Egypt, definitely as the climate warms and their droughts are longer, Egypt will have a major economic problem with water supply for about 30, 30 million of its population living across the Nile, right? Uh, which will create turmoil for Egypt, which is something that needs to be uh, dealt with. Otherwise, uh, Sisi's uh, control over the country will uh, deteriorate and then the fate of the Suez Canal and the major choke point uh, will be uh, uh, in jeopardy. Right? And this is becoming a major conflict. Just last week, the Ethiopian prime minister uh, announced that the uh, uh, talks between the three countries have failed and that he's going to go ahead and build the dam anyway. And this is caricatures, cartoons from Arab newspapers just from the past week. You can see that uh, uh, it's becoming more and more uh, 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 you know, violent or, or even, you know, might become more than just a, a conflict of words. And so the US is trying as much as it can to talk with the sides and make them come to a compromise. For that, the Trump administration needed uh, to get Egypt and Sudan and Ethiopia to the negotiating table to talk to them. The problem is you technically by law can't talk to Sudan because Sudan is a state a sponsor of terrorism according to US law. And so in order to talk to it and provide it with aid and provide it with help and create some kind of mediation between the sides, you need to take it off the list, right? Which is something that Trump did and, and showed it as part of a US-Israel, uh, of a US-Sudan agreement, a peace agreement between the two, when a huge part of that was to get Sudan uh, into the negotiation table to help Egypt, right? So Israel plays a role here as well in helping uh, uh, the sides. So that's one uh, area where uh, the US and the new Biden administration, right, Trump failed with the negotiations. So last week, uh, the Ethiopian prime minister said he's going to do it anyway, and these are caricatures from the last week. So the Biden administration is going to have a huge headache with this, and he's going to need to talk to these sides. Okay, now keep in mind, Sudan is still massacring people in Darfur. It hasn't stopped being a state sponsor of terrorists, but we need them right now to solve this. So that's one, right? That's the 5.5 million barrels that are going through the Suez. Another uh, issue that the Biden administration is going to have a huge headache with is Turkey, right? Now, Turkey is a huge ally for, uh, a very important ally for the US, not just because, uh, right, mainly because of its geography, not just because a lot of oil goes through the Straits of the Bosphorus from Russia into the Mediterranean, but also because Turkey is a NATO member and it's preventing Russian Navy ships from entering the Mediterranean in case there's a war between Russia and a European state, right? Assuming that Russia attacks uh, Europe and NATO intervenes, then the Russians would want Navy, mil, mil, uh, 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 Navy ships into the Mediterranean Sea. And so long as Turkey is a major ally of the US and Europe, it won't allow these ships to go through. Right? The other option that Russia has to get into the Mediterranean Sea is through the Gibraltar states, which are controlled by the UK. So obviously it won't be able to go through that. Or the Suez Canal, which again, so long as Egypt is an ally of the US, won't be able to do that as well. And that hampers Russia's abilities. Right? Keep in mind, Russia doesn't have a lot of ports that are uh, available 365 days a week. Most of its ports freeze during the winter. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the only ports that it has that operate all the time is over here in Sevastopol, in Crimea, which is why they conquered Crimea. But they can't get through unless someone gives them a place to uh, uh, dock their ships. The only country willing to do that is Syria. So Syria is willing to give, uh, so Russia always has Navy uh, military ships uh, in Tartus, in Syria. But again, they need to go through Turkey, and that's just a temporary solution. For that, Turkey needs to be appeased. And a major problem that Turkey has is the current border disputes over gas fines in the Mediterranean that it has with Greece. Right? So 
Greece claims that Turkey doesn't, that uh, all of this area is part of its economic exclusive zone. And so every gas find that is found in this area belongs to Greece. Turkey has a difference of opinion and claims that all of this area belongs to Turkey, right? And so they have a major uh, dispute among them, which includes sending warships against one another uh, over this gas find. And of course, this, had, this involves Israel because the whole idea is that most of this gas, uh, if it's found, needs to be exported to Europe through gas pipelines that will be built from Israel and will go through the exclusive economic zone of what Turkey claims it's, it, it's, uh, it belongs to it. So any, this, so any agreement to export gas from this region into Europe to help it diversify away from Russia will have to involve Turkey. You have to get Turkey into the negotiations. And for that, you need, to, you need Israel to agree to bring in Turkey, which is something that Israel is willing to do. But you need to make Israel part of it because most of the gas in this area that Turkey also claims that it wants to be part of is in Israel's exclusive and economic zone. And even the ones that are in Cyprus needs to be connected to, right? They're not big enough. They need to be connected to Israel's gas to get exported. So again, if the US wants Turkey to be appeased and it needs it on its side, Israel is also involved in this. And, Turkey, and, and Russia, as, it, as it's not able to buy uh, gas fields, in Israel or in the region, uh, or to get Turkey on its side, is trying to buy gas fields in Lebanon or in Cyprus or in Egypt in order to get other countries to allow its, its Navy ships to uh, dock. So long as the US disengages from this area and leaves a vacuum, the Russians are going to come in. So long as, Ru as the US doesn't uh, itself send companies to look for oil and gas in Lebanon or helps mediate the dispute over maritime borders between Turkey and uh, Greece, or between Lebanon and Israel, um, uh, then, then Russia will come in. And so the US, there's no vacuum in this region. And if the US leaves, Russia is going to try to come in as quickly as it can, right? And of course, Russia's involvement in Syria, which also involves Israel due to uh, constant Israeli strikes, which are coordinated with Russia. So that's another issue, right? So we said the Suez Canal and Sudan involves Israel. Turkey and Russia's involvement in this region involves Israel. And of course, the biggest choke points are the Straits of Hormoz and the Bab el Mandeb, right? Yet, uh, the Bab el Mandeb if you, uh, is a major source of contention. 4.8 billion barrels of oil go through it uh, every day. It is, it, Bab el Mandeb means the gate of tears or, or the gate of sorrow, because a lot of ships throughout history have sunk in this uh, very narrow strait. A, because it's a very treacherous area. You see how shallow it can be. And B, because there's a lot of pirate activities here, activity here throughout the history, et cetera. This is a main, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm talking about this is this is the main reason for why there is currently a civil war in Yemen and why Saudi Arabia and Iran are so involved in it, right? This is not just about oil. This is not just about Iran wanting to take control of this area over here through the Houthi uh, in order to control the Straits. This also has to do with immigration. Uh, climate change, right, is also part of the new Middle East. It means that there is going to be more and more migration. Uh, we often talk about migration from Sudan and Syria into uh, Europe and how much problems it's creating for Europe. But most of these refugees are not going to Europe. Most of these refugees are going to the countries around them. And a lot of that is going into Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. And they're going through Yemen. That's the easiest area from the Horn of Africa Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, all of these places that are really, really struggling because of droughts and, and, and civil war, they're all running, crossing the, the, the Bab el Mandeb into the lawless area that is currently Yemen and straight into Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, right? That means more immigrants that Saudi Arabia does not need. That means economic problems. And that means Saudi Arabia has an interest in intervening. And of course, right? in order to intervene, or the reason why you're intervening is so you can make sure that the Sunnis are still in control of, of, of uh, Yemen. The Sunnis are currently in the best strategic locations. Uh, they control the Bab el Mandeb right over here. They control the entire coastline. So if they control this area, then immigrants are not coming in, or refugees are not coming in from Sudan and the Horn of Africa. And so long as the coastline is controlled by the Sunnis, then this area is stable. And so the Sunnis are supported by Saudi Arabia and the USA. And the Shia over here, the Houthi, are, uh, uh, are supported by Iran. 
The reason for that is that Iran wants to take control of the Babul Mandan because currently, right, you can see it over here, the, the Shia are also uh, flowing into Saudi Arabia. So any problem that the Shia, that, uh, that Yemen has, that the Sunnis and the Shias have over here, automatically spills into Saudi Arabia itself. So you can't convince Saudi Arabia to not be engaged in Yemen. And you can't convince it to stop bombing and, and starving uh, uh, the Shia, the Houthi in Yemen, because it is very, it has very strong interests in being there and controlling whoever controls the straits. And so the US has a headache to deal with. How does it make Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia uh, remain and have its interests and control this area because that's good for the US, but not um, uh, starve and, and do the uh, war crimes that it's committing in Yemen. Now, the reason Iran wants control of this area is because the other area, this major area, the Straits of Hormuz, which Iran frequently uh, uh, threatens to uh, block, is less credible of a threat, right? The Straits of Hormuz, where most of the oil that is exported, or at least, uh, about half of the oil that's exported is going through the Straits of Hormuz, Iran constantly threatens to stop, right, to block the Straits of Hormuz, to, to stop it. This is kind of, it's an empty threat because it's kind of like shooting yourself in the head uh, if the cops break in. That if, if, if Iran blocks the Straits of Hormuz, then Iran also can't export any of its oil because it's also going through the Straits of Hormuz. So it's a bit of an empty threat. And so what Iran does instead is it plays a much more clever game, right? Um, it, instead of blocking the Straits, it's trying to, uh, uh, sabotage Saudi Arabia's ability to uh, um, export oil. The reason why it's bombing um, uh, oil refineries in Saudi Arabia, and the reason why it's bombing uh, uh, oil tankers uh, belonging to Saudi Arabia is because Iran is currently under huge economic strain. It doesn't have any, under the Trump sanctions, it, it made its economy uh, even worse off than before, which creates uh, protests in the streets, which can create potential ethnic uprisings because half of the people in Iran are not Farsi, they're not Persians, they're Azeri, they're Baluch, they're Arabs. And so when there's protests over there, it can quickly become into an ethnic insurrection and calls for secession. So the current situation in Iran is very dire and they need the price to go up as much as possible, as quickly as possible, the price of oil, because that's their main source of revenue. And since they can't really block the Straits of Hormuz, because that means that they can't export oil uh, either, then the best way to do it is to decrease supply and to bomb Saudi Arabia and its, tank and, and its tankers so that there'll be less oil in the market and so that uh, the price will go up and it will get uh, economic relief. And so in order to get the Iranians to stop bombing oil facilities, right? And keep in mind, the US does not need oil from Saudi Arabia. The US is not dependent on oil from Saudi Arabia. Most of the oil from the Gulf isn't going to the US. Most of uh, the oil in the US is either domestic made or it's from uh, North America, uh, Canada, Mexico, uh, Venezuela before the sanctions and uh, Nigeria if needed. How however, most of the oil that Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are exporting is going to allies of the US, China, uh, not China, sorry, South Korea, Japan and Europe. And of course, China is a major consumer of oil from the Gulf states. And again, as I said, if there is no if there is no oil, if something happens to the oil tankers of Saudi Arabia, if something happens to the oil refineries, and the price goes up, that means that the price goes up for China. That means the products in manufacturing and shipping goes up. And that means that uh, prices in the U.S. goes up uh, as well, whether they are directly dependent on the oil from the Gulf or not, because oil is a global commodity, and oil is in everything that we have. And so in order to get Iran to stop doing this, in order to get Iran some kind of economic relief, you have to renegotiate a nuclear plan with it. You have to go back to the nuclear talks that the Obama administration created with Iran, and you have to renew uh, uh, these talks. Uh, in what configuration can you get the Iranians to retrust the US? That is another source of headache for the new Biden administration. And of course, you can't disconnect this from what's going on with Israel and the alliance that Israel is currently creating with the Sunni states against Iran, right? Because uh, as Iran is bombing 
tankers, uh, Saudi tankers. It doesn't seem like the US is able to stop this. And yet Israel is doing it instead. Israel is, uh, is currently in the past few years consistently bombing and sabotaging Iranian tankers every time they hit a Saudi or an Emirati uh, oil tanker. So while we only saw this last year, it's been a few years now that Israel is directly cooperating with Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the other Gulf states in order to help them against Iran. So Israel is directly responsible for this and of course, uh, constantly uh, uh, nuclear scientists find their death. Now, a lot of the times you will see that uh, in journal, in the journalists in the US, et cetera, will talk about this as Israel trying to sabotage the nuclear talks. Right? Every time you hear about a nuclear scientist uh, in Iran being assassinated or a tanker or a ship, uh, an Iranian ship being uh, bombed by Israel, you will often be, this will often be linked to the US uh, uh, Biden's administration's attempts to renew nuclear talks. And I, I will argue that it's not exactly, or you will, you will see journalists argue that this is an attempt by Israel to sabotage the talks or to prevent them from happening. And I will argue that that's not what Israel is trying to do. Israel is trying to make a point to the US administration to tell the new US administration, the Biden administration, that you can't disconnect the nuclear issue from the other issues that Iran is currently doing. Because Israel does not see the major problem uh, with Iran as having the nuclear bomb, but what the nuclear bomb enables Iran to do in the region. Iran does, Israel doesn't actually think that Iran will shoot a nuclear bomb at it. Right, Israel has reportedly uh, nuclear bombs itself and a second strike capability. And so it doesn't make any rational sense to do this. However, the nuclear bomb is going to enable Iran to do things that it was never able to do before. And that is what Israel is trying to prevent. And that is the point that Israel is trying to make. If you want during the q and I can talk a little bit more about why this is important uh, and, and why is Israel doing what it's doing. Okay, so Israel has uh, a major uh, part in the nuclear negotiations, in the sabotage of tankers over here, in the constant Shia Sunni conflict that is uh, preventing, that is uh, uh, threatening oil exports. It has a role in the Sudanese, Egyptian, uh, Ethiopian negotiations. It has a role in Turkey's uh, uh, desires in the region and in Russia's involvement in the region. And so the conclusion of all of this spiel is that the Middle East is a priority for the Biden administration, whether it wants to or not. And the Middle East is going to be a major headache for the Biden administration, whether it wants to or not. And as such, Israel is a priority as well because it is involved in each one of these issues, in each one of these headaches. It could be a problem and it could be a solution for each one of these headaches, right? But the question is, and this is where I'm going to go to the next section of the talk, are the Palestinians a priority? And so, in other words, does the Israel-Palestinian conflict affect, affect these developments in the Middle East? Does the Israel-Palestinian conflict affect the, the interests and the problems that the Biden administration needs to deal with? Because for decades, the answer of each US administration was yes. You can't get anywhere in the Middle East without solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You can't get regional stability in the Middle East without solving the conflict. You can't get the different countries to talk to one another without first solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. If Israel can be a solution to some of the problems there in the region, then first it has to deal with the conflict. However, in the past decade, in the past 10 years, especially since the Arab Spring and definitely accelerated during the Trump administration, the answer is maybe not so much. Israel is a priority and, for, and, and will remain a priority for the US, whether it wants to or not, regardless of the warm special relations between the two. Regardless if a new, uh, if a new US president, even if it was Bernie Sanders, if it likes uh, Israel or not, it needs Israel as a priority in the region. The question is, does it need uh, Palestinians? And are the Palestinian-Israeli conflict a problem that needs to be solved? And with that comes the question of, are the Abraham Accords good or bad for the peace between Israel and the Palestinians? Is the legacy that the Trump administration left to the Biden administration, is that good or is that bad for the, uh, uh, for the peace talks? 
And should we care, right? Are the peace talks important currently? Now, the answer to this, again, I'm not going to give an opinion. I'm going to give two of the arguments. I'm going to confront them with one another. And I'm trying to, I will try to convince you that each of these arguments is correct. And you will have to make the decision of which one is the right one, right? Are the Abrahamic Accords, is the, or in other words, does the Trump legacy help the Biden administration or, or does not help the Biden administration advance peace in between the Israelis and the Palestinians? And again, the answer depends on who you think holds more responsibility for the freeze in the talks between them. Whether you are consciously aware of this or subconsciously aware of this, your opinion regarding the Abraham Accords depends on who you think is to blame regarding the fact that there's currently no peace between Israelis and Palestinians. If you think that the main responsibility is on Israel, then you would think that the Abra then you would argue that the Abraham Accords are bad for peace negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. If you think that the main responsibility is on the Palestinians, then you will think that this is a very good advancement and that Trump has done a lot to advance a, any kind of chance of peace uh, between the two. So now I will convincingly argue both of the sides, okay? The side that says that the main responsibility is on Israel. And, so, and, and because you've signed an agreement between Israel and the Arab countries, then now Israelis are much less incentivized to, uh, uh, to have peace or to even talk to the Palestinians has a lot of merit to it. There is a strong argument to this to say that the Abraham Accords are not as good. And this has to do with the Israeli elections. I'm going to talk very briefly about this because um, we don't know yet who the next prime minister is going to be. Currently, uh, Netanyahu got the uh, a mandate to try to create a coalition. What happens with that, I don't know yet. And so I'm not going to give predictions. What I will say is that there are two ways to look at this results. One is the way that we keep seeing currently in the news, which is two blocks, the pro-Netanyahu block and the anti-Netanyahu block, and those that are uncommitted and the question of whether Netanyahu will be able to get the uncommitted to its side, whether for the first time in history will it get an Arab, uh, an Arab uh, uh, party to be part of its coalition, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's a lot to say about this, uh, about Netanyahu as a personality and how much of a division he's creating among Israelis, right? Not just among US Jews and, and American politics, but within Israelis. Just the fact that this is how we look at the blocks as pro-Netanyahu and anti-Netanyahu block. Although again, in the anti-Netanyahu block, it's not a block. It's, it, they have nothing to do with one another in terms of ideology, either, other than the fact that they don't like, uh, like Netanyahu. There's a lot to say about this. It's very surprising and it's somewhat of a defeat to Netanyahu the fact that the Likud only got 30 seats, seven seats less than the previous elections. Keep in mind that between these elections, uh, uh, Netanyahu created three historic peace agreements and brought vaccinations to Israel before any other country. And yet he got less uh, votes than he did before. So in, th in this sense, this is a major defeat. But if we just look at the Israeli elections through this, then we are being very topical and very current, but we are missing the bigger issue here and the bigger long-term trend, uh, which is causing a lot of concern for the pro-peace camp, which is that this is, not a, this is not how Israeli politics actually look like. This is just a personal issue, whether you like Netanyahu or not. But when you actually look at who here is left and who here is right, Israel doesn't have a left anymore. It barely has a left anymore. The only parties that are considered or that are willing to call themselves left is the Labour Party with seven seats and Meretz Party with six seats. So overall 13. And I'm talking about the Jewish parties, right? I'm not talking about the uh, uh, Arab parties, of course. But among the Jewish parties in Israel, right, which are 80% of the population, there's barely 20% that still call themselves left and that have even mentioned the word peace and that even mentioned Palestinians in their election campaign. All the rest either call themselves center-right or right, right, Likud, or extreme-right, which is Israel Beiteinu, right, the Russian party, or Yamina, or the most extreme-right, which is the Tzirmut Datit, right, which there's a lot to say about them, but not going to. There is barely any left, uh, left in Israel. Even Kaholavan under Benny Gantz, has not mentioned in either 
not in this election, neither, neither in the three elections that took place uh, last year, the word peace did not come out of his lips. The only, the only thing in his campaign was how much uh, Arabs did he kill while he was the uh, chief of staff, uh, 1,400. That, that was his campaign. How many Arabs did he kill? He did not talk about peace. He did not talk about the two-state solution. And this is the issue here. What happens, right? Only 20% only of the Jewish population actually voted for the left in the, in the current elections. All the rest voted for different variations of center right or extreme right. The, the, dif the difference is whether you like uh, Bibi or not, or whether you're religious or whether you're Ashkenaz religious or Sephardic religious, but you are right, right wing in how you voted. 80% of the Jewish population. And so the question is, why does that happen? And here is the important part because, and this is what the argument is against the Abraham Accords. Whether you, um, whether Bibi will remain the prime minister or not, I don't know, right? There's also the whole trial thing, although keep in mind that the trial will, will be for the next two to three years. So don't count on the trial uh, uh, and the corruption charges to do anything because it's, it's going to be years from now. Whether Bibi is going to be the, the prime minister uh, in a few months from now or not, whether he will uh, get out, out of the political scene or not, his legacy, is going to continue for the foreseeable future. And the legacy that he created, the, the change in perception that he created among the Israeli population is exactly that, that 80%, 20%. The fact that the left doesn't exist anymore because Bibi has been very, very um, uh, talented in making Israelis believe, whether they are or most in the left that moved now to the center that don't want to call themselves left anymore, because he convinced Israel that making peace with the Palestinians isn't worth it. The risk is higher than the rewards. Because when we think about why we need peace with the Palestinians, why we need a two-state solution, right? There are high risks with the two-state solution. There's, uh, the, the, there's the risk that the Palestinian Authority will collapse and then we will have terrorists and undefendable uh, borders. Uh, there's the issue of Jerusalem and the holy places and Hebron and the tombs of the patriarchs. There's a lot of compromise and, and sacrifices that you're making for a two-state solution. But if you make the two-state solution, then you're gaining a lot as well, right? And those that have been in my previous talks already know this spiel, right? You're gaining security, right? That's the idea. When you think about why, what's so great about peace with the Palestinians, you're getting security and well-being for Israeli citizens, right? Buses are not blowing up. Uh, people are not uh, being killed, right? So security. Peace gives you security. The second thing that peace gives you is economic growth. More countries will stop boycotting you, will invest in you, right? Peace brings uh, uh, growth. It brings more uh, foreign direct investment, uh, more countries sending their products, right? After the Oslo agreement, suddenly McDonald's, Pepsi, IBM, Microsoft, Mitsubishi, they all suddenly came to Israel after boycotting them for 50 years. And the third thing that a peace with the Palestinians brings is good relations with the other countries in the Middle East, right? Peace in the Middle East, which is what Israelis have always wanted, uh, not to live on their sword. This, is, has, this has been the paradigm for 60 years, 70 years, that we need peace with the Palestinians or peace right in the region, or at least since the Oslo Accord, because it will give us security, economic growth, and good relations with the countries around us. BB has changed this, uh, this uh, calculation because if you already have security, why risk peace? If you can build a wall and, and since building the wall, the wall uh, terrorism, suicide bombers have decreased by 90%. Keep in mind, buses blow up in Tel Aviv during peace negotiations because Hamas doesn't want uh, right, uh, the peace negotiations to occur because they oppose the two-state solution. I'll get to that in a moment. Peace, uh, buses explode when peace is being talked about, when peace is in the air, when, there's, when there are talks. So if you already have security, why risk peace? Under the 10 years of Netanyahu, Israel has enjoyed its most secure decade that it remembers. Yes, there were occasional uh, rounds uh, against Gaza. Yes, there were some stabbings now and then, but you can't compare that to buses exploding in Haifa and Jerusalem and, and, and Tel Aviv before Netanyahu, and, and Israelis keep that in mind. There is no, Israelis are not afraid to go in the streets as I was when I was a teenager. 
If you have security, why risk peace? If you already have economic growth, why risk peace? Under Netanyahu in the past 10 years, Israel's economy has grown. A startup nation has grown. Israel's relationship with countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Europe, new trade deals that we never had since the 70s when they boycotted us because of the Arab oil embargo. Netanyahu has managed to recreate. Israel's economy is best than it ever was. Yes, it's very expensive to live in Tel Aviv. It's also expensive to live in Tokyo and in London and in New York, but it, you can live in Haifa where I live and it's fine. And the economy is doing great and salaries are increasing. So if you already have economic growth, why risk peace? And the third thing, right? I said security, we have that. Economic growth, we have that. Relationship with other countries, other Arab countries, we have that. Bibi Netanyahu broke a taboo that says that Israel can not sign a peace agreement with other Arab countries until it makes peace with the Palestinians. Well, it just did. So why would Israel risk peace with the Palestinians? So that is the first argument. That is the argument against the Abraham Accords. That is the argument that says that the Trump legacy, while created these good historic moments, has been detrimental to the peace negotiations with the Palestinians. The other side of this argument is the one that shifts most of the blame to the Palestinians and says, and if, if, and if you go through this uh, argument, then the Trump administration has done a lot of good by changing a lot of paradigms in this uh, conflict. Because when you look at it from the Palestinian side, the P, for the PLO, peace is not a good idea either. It's not just the Israelis. For Abu Mazen, the peace uh, 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 going into peace negotiations currently with the Israelis, when I say currently, I mean in the past six years and for the foreseeable future, it is a very bad idea for the PLO's stability, for its uh, ability to uh, keep control of the West Bank. A, because elections are around the corner and there's a lot of pressure in the Palestinian street to have an election. And if that happens, then, and the PLO is being seen talking to Israel, then most likely Hamas will win the elections. And Abu Mazen's health is currently deteriorating. He has months, maybe a year to still live, and he doesn't have a successor. During periods of transition, you want to keep everything quiet. And currently Abu Mazen, whether you, whether Netanyahu admits to or not, is a great partner for Israel. He keeps quiet. If you are a militant Israel, uh, if you're a militant young Palestinian in the West Bank that wants to do something against the Israelis or the settlers, you are more likely to be stopped and tortured by Abu Mazen's police force than before you even get to encounter an IDF soldier. The Palestinian youth, especially, sees the PLO under the Abu Mazen as a corrupt crony uh, 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 a, a puppet of the Zionists and the Americans. They want to see him fall and they want Hamas to take over because Hamas are the only, uh, are the only organ or maybe they don't want Hamas because they're not religious, they're secular youth. But Hamas is the only organization that is still promising them what they always dreamed about because whatever you uh, would like to say about the Trump uh, agreement, right? The, tr the Trump peace agreement, the agreement of the century that says, right? A lot of people joked about the Trump uh, peace uh, uh, um, initiative and said that it's a non-starter and said that it's an insult to the Palestinians. And of course the Palestinians will not uh, talk about it. Well, the most advanced peace negotiation that the Israelis have ever reached with, uh, uh, with uh, the Palestinians the Olmert peace plan that Obama tried to uh, advance is also an insult to the Palestinians. We tend to think of a two-state solution as something that is very desirable to the Palestinians if we can only get the Israelis to agree with, if we can only stop the settlements. But you need to be in the mindset of a Palestinian and to understand that a two-state solution is a very deceptive word because a two-state solution is a rotten deal. It's just a term of use, right? We say two-state solution, one-state solution. Uh, and, and we know there is no one-state solution. One state is a predicament. It's not a solution. It's what happens if we don't find a two-state solution, then a one-state solution will be created, a one-state will be created, which needs to be dealt with. But a two-state solution is also just a term of expression because no US president, whether it's Trump, whether it's Obama, whether it's Clinton, no Israeli prime minister, whether it's Barack, whether it's Rabin, 
whether it's Sharon or Olmert or, or Bibi, none of them has ever offered the Palestinians a state. We say two states as if we have an Israeli state and a, and a Palestinian state, but none of them have ever offer, offered is, uh, Israel a state um, in the way that we think a state is or what a state means. Because the Palestinians in every, in every uh, uh, solution that we offer them, we're not offering them uh, control over their borders, right? We will encircle them completely so they won't have free movement. They won't have a monopoly over the source of violence because anytime uh, uh, there's an issue or terrorism or Hamas, et cetera, then Israel will have the ability to come in. We're not offering them free. We, they won't be able to have a military. They will have to be demilitarized and they won't have access, free access across their borders or free air zone. So it's less than a state. The, the very essence of a state, which is a monopoly over the source of violence, they won't have. They won't have a bunch of other things that, uh, that uh, even the most generous peace negotiations have given them. And so for, for the Palestinians, the boast you're offering them is something less than a state, which, which if you're pro-Palestinian will say, oh, I'm giving you a, something more and some land swaps. And if you're anti-Palestinian, you're giving them very few, but for the Palestinians, both sides, are not giving them anything really. Because when you look what the Palestinians want, what their, ide what, what their um, ideal scenario is, what their dream is, is not this piece of land that was left to them during the 1948 ceasefire agreement between the Israelis and the Jordanians. This is not Palestine. This is the West Bank, which the British are calling the West Bank because it's in the West Bank of the Jordan River. And this is the Gaza Strip. None of this is Palestine. Palestine is all of this. When you look at each one of the logos of the Palestinians, whether it's Hamas or the PLO or the women's rights movement or the Palestine General Federation of Trade Unions, this is the map, this is Palestine. And what you're saying to the Palestinians when you're offering them a two-state solution is that you will never be able to return to your homes. You will never be able to get Palestine back. What you will get is this little area that the Jordanians and the Israelis have left to you, um, plus minus what the Americans are willing to give you in land swaps, and, that, and you will call that Palestine. Although most of you are not from there. Six million, right, refugees are not from the West Bank or Gaza, nor do they want to return to the West Bank or Gaza because they're not from there, so it's not returning. They're from Haifa, they're from Tzfat, they're from Yafo, and they hold the original key to their house that they left. Right? And two-state solution means telling grandma that she can't go back home. And so every time that Abu Mazen sits with an Israeli prime minister, that means, and talks about a two-state solution, that means grandma is not coming back home. And the more militant sides of the Palestinians, definitely the more religious like Hamas, that's the time when they blow up buses and that's the time when they get the most support. And the fact that, and so talking now to the Israelis, while Abu Mazen's health is deteriorating, why are their elections important? Is the worst thing that you can do if you're the PLO, because that means for sure a victory of Hamas and a topple of the PLO. Remember that the refugees that are currently sitting in Lebanon and in Jordan and in Syria have been massacred through decades. They don't have any rights in Lebanon or in Syria or in uh, uh, or in Jordan, and they don't want to stay there. And when you're saying two-state solution, you're basically telling them stay there, right? Because there's no room for 6 million refugees in the West Bank. So you're basically telling these refugees that have no rights, that for 80 years have been living with no access to education, with no citizenship, a baby, a Palestinian baby currently born in Lebanon. His father was born in Lebanon. His, his, his grandfather was born in Lebanon. But his great-grandfather was born in, in, in Palestine before 1948. He is considered a Palestinian refugee. He is not being counted in the Lebanon, in the Lebanese census. He doesn't have any access to health or education by the Lebanese. And if he says something about it, he will be shot. And so their only access to anything is through UNRWA, through the UN. And basically in a two-state solution, you're telling them, well, you have to stay there. That's your life now. And uh, to stay in Lebanon and to Jordan, among the people that have massacred you uh, many times, whether it's Black September or Sabah and Shatila, or the current civil war. Imagine Palestinians in Syria being told that they can't go back. And so what Trump did uh, uh, is flip the equation. It's a chicken and egg kind of thing. In, in one sense, you're saying, okay, I can't solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict 
without solving the Palestinian refugee issue. I need to tell them to stay where they are because that's the only solution of a two-state solution. But in order to do that, I need the Arab countries, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Syria, to treat these people better, to give them citizenship, to give them education. Otherwise, why would they stay there? Otherwise, uh, UNRWA will keep uh, taking care of them even though there's a Palestine now. So why is there still a Palestinian refugee agency? The only way I can create a two-state solution is if the refugees have a solution as well. And that means I need Arab states to be part of the peace agreement, especially the rich ones, especially Saudi Arabia and the UAE that can pay, that have some say and some uh, leverage over Lebanon, over Jordan, over Egypt, uh, maybe over Syria in the future, to pay them and to get them to agree to give citizenship to the Palestinian refugees so they, they will stay there in a, uh, in a two-state solution. So on the one hand, you say, I can't have peace with the Arab countries without a two-state solution. But on the other hand, you're saying, I can't have a two-state solution without the Arabs having peace with Israel and agreeing to this to pay uh, Lebanon and Jordan and Syria, et cetera. And so Trump, for the first time, flipped the equation. He managed to get Israel and the rich, oil-rich Arab countries to sign a peace agreement. And so now you can actually finally talk about settling the refugee problem in a way that you couldn't do that before. In that sense, Trump created a ground for the Biden administration that no administration has had before. So for the, and I will end just with this, I'm sorry, I'm way over 40 minutes, right, I'm an hour. For the time being, Biden administration doesn't need to concert with the Palestinians because neither of the sides have, a, have an interest to currently talk. And right now the Palestinians, as they currently are, aren't interfering with the other issues of the region because the other countries don't see the Palestinians as an issue anymore. The UAE doesn't say, I will not cooperate with Israel to stop the Iranians without the Palestinians. It is willing and it, and it has. So right now, Biden doesn't need to be considered with this. What will change the equation is the death of Abu Mazen and who will ever succeed him, whether Hamas will take over, whether Abu Mazen, uh, the successors over the possible successors for Abu Mazen, whether it's the Khlan, whether it's Barghouti, whether it's someone else, how they will take control in order for to take control against, uh, uh, to replace Abu Mazen, they will have to show the Palestinian youth, the ones that hate Abu Mazen and hate the PLO and see them as a Zionist puppet, they will need to show them we are not Zionist puppets. We will offer you what Hamas is offering you, but without the religion, because you're secular. Most of the Palestinians in the West Bank are secular. So we are anti-Israel, we are anti-US, uh, we are anti-two-state solution. We will fight your fight and we will give grandma her home back uh, if you vote for me and not for Hamas. And so Israel will have to deal after Abu Mazen. Either Abu Mazen will be able to choose a successor that will keep this corrupt uh, government that the Palestinian youth hates and wants to topple, or a battle of succession will begin where each side is going, is going to try to win over Palestinian youth by showing how violent and anti-Israeli he is. And so the death of Amazon might flip the equation, might create a major situation for the Biden administration to intervene. Until that happens, Biden doesn't need to consider himself and won't consider himself with this issue. He has bigger fish to fry in the Middle East. Okay, that's it for my talk. Uh, I'm way over time. So uh, we have time uh, for questions. I, uh, you know, Bob, that I will always be over time. Eli, thank you so, so much. It was a superb presentation. It was a very unique presentation. Um, there was some concern, oh, well, the, the numbers will go down after an hour if we stay on that long. We are 10 or 15% more participation now than when we started. And we, had, and, and we lost a couple and have gained more. So, so there's a lot of people that are still on. Um, I, I do want to thank you uh, from everybody, and we will be going over our, our sponsors later, but we would like to stay and ask a couple of questions. We have some stu of your students that we would like to now call uh, one each, and, uh, and if, if the audience would like to stay on, and we will answer questions and, and continue for a little while as long as people are interested. So, uh, but I, I encourage you, there's some very good questions. I know that you'll hear that. And we'll try to be brief with the answers for them so that we'll be yeah. able to get to a couple of audience questions. So with that, I would like to introduce Philip Kessler, um, who is a student of Dr. Reddick's. And uh, he's a junior at Washington University from Maryland. 
He is majoring in political science and history. So uh, Philip, uh, go ahead and uh, come on and ask your question. Great, uh, thanks so much for the, for the lecture. Um, uh, I was uh, gonna ask, um, related to COVID, um, there's obviously an enormous amount of uh, inequality between uh, Israeli citizens, which have done a really great job vaccinating their citizens and Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Um, so I was wondering what responsibility does Israel have under the Oslo Accords, the Geneva Convention, uh, to provide Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza with COVID vaccines during this crisis? And even if they have zero responsibility, do you think that if they had provided a lot more vaccinations to begin with, this would have been an opportunity to lessen tensions and increase their, the public perception among Palestinians uh, towards Israel? Okay. Thanks, Philip, for the question, and I'll answer briefly. And uh, by the way, Philip is still my student, so I can grade, so he's dependent on my grade, so that, uh, no, but a good question. Uh, I will answer very briefly. You kind of answered kind of the answer that I was giving. Yes, if we just look at the dry paper and what Israel is actually responsible to the Oslo Agreement, then Israel doesn't have a responsibility to give the vaccinations to uh, the Palestinians, and technically the Palestinians didn't ask for the vaccinations. They made it a point to get the vaccinations from the Russians. So the PLO would not look like it's getting the vaccination from Israel, thus strengthening this feeling that it's just a puppet of the Zionists, right? Um, although the manager of the upper echelon did get vaccina vaccinations behind the scenes. Um, but that's the dry kind of analysis. No, Israel shouldn't, and they didn't ask. Um, but but you already answered that, you're right. You said, uh, and if, even if they don't have, should they have, taken this opportunity. Three months ago, I will tell you no. Uh, I wouldn't expect a country that is just getting uh, vaccinations, um, that doesn't know if it will still get vaccinations, will it have enough for a second dose, right, three months ago, in a time where almost no country got vaccinations, when the U.S. was still reeling and, and frustrated from not getting vaccinations, to expect Israel to provide vaccinations to other people who are not citizens, who are technically enemies of the state. I think that's a little bit of a, of a tall order to ask from anyone. And I don't think that anyone expected that from any other country to give it to someone who is not citizens. Having said that, if you ask me today, then yes, Israel should transfer vaccinations to uh, Palestinians. Uh, I don't think a country should be criticized by prioritizing its citizens first during a crisis. But once you've taken care of your citizens, once it's clear that you're a citizen, that you have kind of vaccinated whoever needs to be or got to a tipping point, which Israel got to a month and a half. I don't know anyone who is not vaccinated currently in my extended family or, or, or anywhere. At this point, not providing vaccinations to the Palestinians doesn't, it doesn't look good. It doesn't, uh, that's, that's most of that I can say, right? But again, I'm not trying to give an opinion, but uh, just for publicity's sake, I would say, keep in mind that in the Palestinian Authority, the situation isn't that bad. So there's also kind of that kind of this emergency, et cetera. But that's, that's a short answer for that. Very good, thank you. Okay, there was another question from another student of yours, Eli Nirenberg. Um, so he is a sophomore, a double major in economics and political science and minoring in Spanish. And he's uh, from Northern Indiana, Munster. So uh, Eli, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you so much for talking today, Professor. Uh, you know, I always appreciate uh, getting to hear your thoughts and analysis. Uh, so my first question was, how does the United States plan to work with Israel and consider Israeli interests as new nuclear negotiations are kicking off with the Iranians and how might, might the U.S. try to placate Israel during this process? Okay, that's that's a great question, Eli. Glad you asked it. And uh, I I was hoping someone would ask me about the nuclear talks because that's that's going to be a major issue. I, I'm going to, again, I'm not uh, bringing my own opinion. However, I will subscribe to a certain argument here. And I will say that every time you read in the newspapers, that something happens between Israel and Iran, that it assassinates a nuclear scientist, et cetera, it will be automatically argued as Israel is trying to sabotage the negotiations because Israel doesn't want a nuclear deal. That is not true. What Israel is trying to do is make a point to the Biden administration 
the same point that the Trump administration got clearly, and one that Israel frust was frustrated that it couldn't give the, the Obama administration. Now, this is not my personal opinion. I'm trying to hear to uh, present here the perspective of the Israeli government under Netanyahu, which has been the government in the Netanyahu in the past 10 years. So it's pretty much the prevailing uh, one uh, for the time being. The problem that Israel has is not with a nuclear agreement. It is with the specific nuclear agreement that Obama signed. For uh, many, for several years, Israel was really on board, Netanyahu was really on board with these talks and with the fact that there are sanctions and pressure on Iran so long as they agree to the nuclear talks. In the, past, in the last year, or, uh, and especially in the past six months of Obama's second term, Israel began being concerned that the US is taking out parts of the agreement that Israel was unwilling to take out. And the concern was that Obama is trying, the Obama administration is trying to get the deal signed before the term ends. And what is important right now is to create a legacy, to sign it before Obama leaves. And because of that, the Obama administration began taking out parts of the agreement that Israel was unwilling to take out. And as Israel voiced its concern and became more and more aggressive to the US regarding why are you taking out these issues, and I'll talk about them in a second, then the US in response cut them out of the negotiations. In which point Netanyahu did things that I very disagree with in how he conducted himself. He went to the Congress, he, he went directly against Obama, he embarrassed him. He went into um, the domestic US politics and created a huge divide also among the Jews in the US, which is something that since Ben Gurion has been a big no-no and a big warning not to do. And I really disagree with how he did that. However, I do subscribe to the sentiment behind that. The sentiment is that the problem is not that Iran will use a bomb against Israel. The whole point of a nuclear bomb is deterrence, is to prevent you from doing something that you would otherwise do. The point of a nuclear bomb is not to use the nuclear bomb. Definitely not against a country that also has a nuclear bomb and a second strike capability. So even if you bomb Tel Aviv and there is no Israel anymore, then Israel still has, according to foreign press, submarines in the middle of the sea that it can shoot and, and decimate Tehran and all the other major cities in Iran. So the assumption is Iran is not going to use a nuclear bomb against Israel, plus Israel can shoot it out of the sky. That's not the concern that Israel has. What the concern that Israel has with the nuclear bomb and what is tried to, to uh, uh, give to the bomb administration is what the nuclear bomb enables Iran to do, which is intervene in the region, uh, intervene in Syria, intervene in Yemen, take over the Straits of Hormuz, take over the Bab al-Mandeb. Every time there's a problem, it can block the Straits, right? It can block the Straits of Hormuz because that's like shooting yourself in the head. But if you block the Bab al-Mandeb with the Houthis, then you're only hurting Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the UAE, and that's a great solution. And we can still get the oil, your oil, Iranian oil at the Straits of Hormuz. So, so the issue that Israel had was, so long as you take out the sanctions and you funnel money into uh, Iran, then you are allowing Iran to continue its adventures, its foreign adventures in the region, take control, help Assad, uh, put Hezbollah missiles on the Israeli border. Now, Right now, Israel is able to bomb these shipments. Every time they try to do a shipment through Sudan, every time they try to do a shipment through Syria, Israel bombs it. If Iran has a nuclear bomb, Israel and the US has much less maneuverability to do anything against Iran. And so the, the fear here is that a nuclear bomb will enable uh, Iran to do things that it previously stopped itself from doing. Plus it will create a nuclear armament uh, uh, competition across the Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia, et cetera. The most volatile region of the world, having nuclear bombs everywhere is not a good idea. And so this is kind of the point that Israel tried to make. Uh, the idea here is that all of the things that the Obama administration took out of the nuclear agreement had to do with that, with ICBM missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which Israel uh, really wanted to be included in the agreement that says basically that Iran is, uh, is uh, not allowed to develop these missiles, and Obama took it out eventually. Uh, issues regarding uh, when do the sanctions uh, continue, and the sanctions uh, only continue if they uh, resume the nuclear agreements. But Israel wanted the sanctions to continue if, is, if Iran becomes more aggressive in the region around it, even if it's not nuclear related. Basically, what Israel tried to, to convey to the uh, US administration 
is the problem is not the bomb, but what it enables. And so it didn't work with the Obama administration. It worked too well with the Trump administration because Israel wanted the Trump administration to renegotiate and insert these issues into the Iranian deal. But they didn't think that Trump would just cancel the deal. I, I was in a, a few years ago, I was in an INSS. This was the right when Trump was elected. And I was in the INSS, the Institute for National Security Studies, in a war game, a war simulation, right? A scenario. And I was in the team of Bogi Elon. Bogi Elon was the his, uh, Minister of Defense at the time. Uh, he, he just retired from being the Minister of Defense after a big blowout with uh, Bibi. And he was kind of the head of the Israeli team. And he, he was in the negotiating table and we tried to come up with a scenario. And he said, listen, um, I assume that Trump will renegotiate the, the agreement. He's not going to cancel that. He's not crazy. He'll just renegotiate it. Uh, but let's see what he can renegotiate. So even Bogie, the Minister of Defense, didn't really think, and he's a very right-wing person. He's a very anti-Bibi, and he's considered anti-Bibi bloc. But he's very right-wing, right? Keep in mind a famous sentence that he said uh, against John Kerry. When John Kerry tried to re, uh, reignite the Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement, he said, can someone please give this person a Nobel Prize and kick them the hell out? Uh, uh, because we, we're getting tired of him. So um, Bogi is not a, is very right. He didn't think that Trump would cancel the deal. Trump completely canceled the deal, which is not what Israel uh, intended. But now that it happened, and the Biden administration needs to reignite the deal, Israel wants to make clear to the Biden administration, you can't detach the things. You can't detach the nuclear agreement with uh, Iran's uh, uh, bombing of Saudi Arabian oil tankers, with Iran's assertiveness in the sea, with the fact that it provides oil to the Syrian Assad regime, with what it's doing in Yemen. You can't disconnect the two. And so long, uh, and to make, to uh, further this point and to, and to make it stick, uh, uh, Israel has an incentive to make it clear that Iran is very, very much uh, active in this area. So if Iran is sending a oil ship to Syria, then Israel will make it known by sabotaging that ship. If, if Iran is trying to get uh, uh, like what happened last week, when it tried to bring a major shipment of weapons, uh, the Saviz uh, that happened three days ago, uh, whether to Yemen or to Syria is still unclear, Israel bombed that ship during the sea. To make it clear and to make it public, and it even announced to the US, and then the US made it public, that Israel sabotaged that ship to make it clear that Iran is doing a lot of things in the region and that if you just take out the sanctions, just because they are willing to uh, freeze the nuclear issue, then you are actually sending money for them to continue all of these shipments and all of their activity in Yemen, et cetera. So the idea here is to make it clear, uh, this link, that if you want to renegotiate a nuclear deal with, if you, Biden, want to renegotiate a nuclear deal with Iran, you need to add the ICBMs Keep in mind, Iran, just because it has a nuclear bomb doesn't mean it can launch it. It needs an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile to actually send the, the nuclear bomb somewhere. So the fact that Obama didn't do anything about the ICBM and during the Obama administration and during the, uh, after the peace, uh, after the JCPOA agreement was signed, they accelerated the ICBM program. For Israel, that was, they, they just took Obama's money and used it to build the intercontinental ballistic missiles that will, that will shoot the nuclear weapons that once they have it. So for Israel, it was, it was, a, tra it was a train wreck, this, new, this specific nuclear agreement, not nuclear agreement in general. So keeping it short, the idea here is not to sabotage the agreement. It is to, it is to force the Biden administration to add the things that Israel wanted to add to the first point. No ICBM, no uh, uh, foreign adventures, the idea here, and this is what the Trump administration was really convinced and how Bibi sold it to them, is yes, Iran technically um, met the requirements of the nuclear proliferation under the Obama administration agreement. They met the deal. They did what the deal told them to do, which is just to not to freeze the nuclear issues. Okay, but they did everything else. They only increased their assertiveness in Syria, et cetera. And so what the Trump administration says is, yes, you met with the deal, but you haven't kept to the spirit of the deal. The spirit of the deal is to be less of a revisionist country in the region, and you haven't done that. So the idea of Israel is to tell the Biden administration, Iran needs to be less of a revisionist state. It needs to be a status quo state. It needs to be uh, uh, to stop its uh, regional ambitions. And so long as that's not part of the nuclear agreement, we will make it clear that it needs to be, right? So ba basically that's, uh, that's it. So that was a long answer. 
but uh, it's a good, so it's a good question. One, and I think something we were all wondering about and, and thinking. Um, one thing I did not tell everybody in the introduction is Eli has been trying to come back to from Israel since August, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. he's still teaching at WashU, but it is almost four in the morning because he's still in Israel. Yeah, I couldn't get to <laughs> and the so US. We, uh, we really all owe him a debt of gratitude for, for being here and so enlightening. But we will ask a couple more questions, but I will promise you we will end in, in like five minutes, okay? We'll, we, we'll okay. Pam Gellin has a question that I'm gonna ask and then we'll stay for a couple more questions. But at that point, I think we should let Eli get a little bit of yeah. sleep. <laughs> also, the, the presentation will be, I'll send it to you. And if anyone wants it, then uh, you can get the presentation, a copy of it. Which is wonderful. I know I have taken his old presentations and used them many times. Okay, so yeah. the question from Pam Gellin, uh, do you think Hamas will have a lot of power without the support of the other Arab countries that are now in the agreements with Israel? That's a, that's a good uh, question. Hamas uh, didn't receive, Hamas's main supporters, according to foreign press, et cetera, is uh, Qatar. Qatar is under a uh, siege by the other Gulf states. So it's not the UAE and Saudi Arabia that was funding Hamas. They, they give most of their support to the PLO, uh, which is seen as kind of the status quo player that is willing to cooperate with Israel and not to create a headache for, um, for, the, uh, uh, for the Gulf states. Keep in mind, Hamas is associated with, is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. And a Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood is considered an enemy of Egypt and of uh, the what we call the moderate Sunni countries in the Gulf. They're not really moderate, but we call them the moderate. That's kind of this dichotomy that we created. Um, and so Hamas is considered a nuisance and an enemy to Saudi Arabia and the UAE as well. And they also put them on the terrorist list, even then. Uh, and so the, and, and Hezbollah as well. And so, the, the main source of revenue is coming from Qatar, but the problem is Qatar is under siege by the other Gulf states and oil prices are going down. And so long as oil prices are low and they have been low since 2015, that means less money for foreign adventurers like, like funding proxy organizations like Hamas. So Hamas, yes, has a major uh, budget constraint. Having said that, uh, Hamas has a good chance of winning uh, elections if they are free elections, right? I'm, I'm, that's a huge asterisk to put. Assuming these are free and fair elections, definitely in Gaza, right? Uh, they're not, they're, there aren't any elections in Gaza, but definitely in Gaza where 70% of the population are refugees. They're not from Gaza. They live in refugee camps and Hamas is promising them to go back to where they are. And that's a, that's a story that you can't overcome. And, and it's a, I, I would say it's a lie. It's a deceit that Hamas is selling to the Palestinian refugees, but they're the only one that are still selling this deceit, uh, this story, this ideal, this... Uh, the PLO in the West Bank has a major problem. It is seen as a uh, corrupt, uh, you know, there, there's barely any Palestinian family that doesn't have someone in the family that wasn't arrested by the PLO uh, police, by Abu Mazen, and, and spent a few days in a basement somewhere being electrocuted. It, it, the Palestinian youth is uh, by and large very, very hateful and resentful towards the PLO and consider themselves consider themselves as kind of hostages of the PLO. Um, having said that, Hamas is not an ideal situation for them because they are not as religious as Hamas is. As, as I said, most of the Palestinians, and they're not secular as we are secular, but they're traditionalists. They don't want all of the things that come with having Hamas as, as ruler. And so, they would rather not vote for Hamas, but if it's Abu Mazen versus Hamas, then, then, then it's a it's a sign. It's kind of it's giving a message to 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 Abu Mazen and the PLO. We are not willing to continue with this situation where you're you're just cooperating with Israel, not allowing allowing the settlements to expand. That is the major source of constraint uh, of issue. Every time the settlements expand, then the Palestinians want to go in protests to protest against this expansion. And the PLO is the one stopping them from doing it and shooting at them and putting them in prisons. And so the way they see it is not only Abu Mazen is compliant and complacent uh, and is willing to give it to, but even the two-state solution he's not giving us. He's just allowing the Israelis to come and wait more and more out of us. Mm -hmm. So the question is who will replace Abu Mazen and how will he see him seen uh, according to the youth? 
The reason I gave the two pictures of Dachlan and Baraguti is that they are considered kind of heroes of the Palestinian people. They're considered, um, uh, one of them is in exile, one of them is in prison currently in, in Israel. They are two Palestinians with a lot of Jewish blood on their hands, but they are the only ones that can probably get the Palestinian youth to support them rather than a more radical version of nationalism or, or Hamas. Israel will have to contend with the fact that whoever will go uh, re replace Abu Mazen is going to be a, a, a person that has a lot of Jewish blood on his hand and we need to talk to this person if, if we do. Unless Abu Mazen is able to create a, a, a suitable replacement that, as, that is as corrupt and as oppressive as his. So the Palestinians don't have a good future in that sense uh, in terms of their national aspirations. If they are willing to, to allow the PLO to remain in its current corrupt state, then they will enjoy the economic growth, they will enjoy the shopping malls that are currently being built in Ramallah, but they won't have a state. They will have less and less and less of a state uh, as time goes by. And it's a, it's a dilemma that I wouldn't want to face if I was a Palestinian youth. Either, I, either fight for a two-state solution and vote for an uh, extreme religious group that I don't like, or allow the current corrupt one to stay in power and, and give up even the two-state solution because he's just allowing the Israelis to do what they want. It's a dilemma and I don't know how they, uh, I don't envy them. Okay, I'm going to make, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to make a, a little executive decision here. We're going to ask one more question and I'm going to ask everybody to put their questions into chat. Uh, please don't raise your hand, that, that won't help. Put your questions into chat and we will get them answered and put them on the St. Louis Friends of, uh, for Israel.com website. Okay, so that you'll be able to go there and we are going to actually post them. We'd also appreciate anybody that likes this and wants more programming to make a donation there. We would really appreciate that. Um, and uh, um, so uh, the last question is going to be from Eviatar Shachar. Um, who is a Shin Shin. He is doing his Shnatshe route or service, year service after high school before the army. And he's at Kuna, no, no, no. so one of the sponsors. And so what Eviatar Shachar had asked was, do you think a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia is something that could happen soon? So if uh, I think that could be a short answer and then, then we'll go ahead and yeah. say thank you. Uh, hi Eviatar, Baruch uh, and uh, great uh, work. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck in St. Louis. It's a great place to uh, be at Shinchinet. Um, that's a great question. The assumption was, the, the current assumption is not under the current king. Right? Keep in mind, Muhammad bin Salman, we keep hearing about, is not the king. He's the prince, he's the crown prince. Uh, the assumption is that one, once MBS, Muhammad bin Salman, comes into power, he will normalize agreements with Israel. Keep in mind, the UAE and Bahrain can't do can't normalize relations with Israel without a green light from Saudi Arabia. So the assumption was they got a certain green light to do this in the first place. And because of that, the assumption it's very clear that the king will not do it. it there's just too much too much weight, historical weight on this. But the son of Muhammad bin Salman might do it if the situation remains as it is, if Iran is still considered a major threat if uh, the Biden administration seems like it's disengaging and, and Saudi Arabia will feel like the way to get the US still involved and the way to get the weapons and the help, right, uh, sabotaging Iranian uh, ships, et cetera, is on behalf of Saudi Arabia. What Israel is currently doing in the Red Sea is on behalf of Saudi Arabia. Uh, assuming that will happen, then Mohammed bin Salman will um, uh, uh, create peace or normalize agreements with Israel, which is something that he's already met if not with Netanyahu, then with the people under Netanyahu, and some say with Netanyahu himself already a couple of times. Having said that, it's not going to be easy. It's not a straight line for Muhammad bin Salman. When Muhammad bin Salman kind of was announced as crown prince, we had a lot of hopes for him. We said he's liberalizing the economy, he's letting women drive for the first time. And then he killed Khashoggi, and he's executing a bunch of people, and we kind of got, oh, he's not, the, he's not what, we, what was promised to us. I will argue that he is still what was promised to us. It is very hard to liberalize and to advance issues in Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is a very delicate balance between the Saudi family and the Wahhabi clerics. The Wahhabis are the most extreme interpretation of 
uh, Sunni Islam, over the Hanbali school of thought. And it's very, very hard to get anything done. It's very hard to let women drive. It's very hard to uh, relax some of the religious laws. Uh, 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 Muhammad bin Salman understands that for his economy, for his security, to counter Iran, he needs good relations with Israel. It is beneficial in every single way. But to do that, to improve his economy, he needs to fight the Wahhabi clerics, and he needs to fight the other members of the family that are against this, that are against relaxing women rights, that are against uh, relations with Israel. That means that if we expect things to be better with Saudi Arabia, and, and if we want Muhammad bin Salman to be the king, and I would argue that Israel has an interest to see Muhammad bin Salman as the future king of Saudi Arabia, he is going to face a lot of threats in the next year. Uh, and in the previous year and then in the year and after that, you will see a lot of executions. You will see a lot of people disappearing from his family. Uh, you will see a lot of people being butchered in, in the, not just Khashoggi. And here, the Biden administration, and you will see a lot of uh, attempts to win credit by bombing Yemen, bombing the Houthis, because you're creating national sentiment and everybody loves the fact that he does that and he's aggressive against Iran. And the Biden administration will have to find a balance where on the one hand, the Biden administration wants to show that it cares about human rights, that it wants to uh, change the Trump legacy, that it doesn't want people to starve in Yemen. On the other hand, it will have to support Mohammed bin Salman as he executes people and violates human rights, which is kind of a weird reality, but that's the reality in the Middle East because only Mohammed bin Salman is seen as someone who's modern enough to make peace with Israel, to advance women's rights, to open up the economy, to that, for, to, to, for him to do that, he needs to fight, literally fight. This is not a democracy. This is not uh, uh, overthrowing or, or being voted. It's, it's making people disappear in order to get what he wants to be advanced, in order to get the right mufti and the right imam to issue the fatwa that he wants in order to allow this and that to happen. So it's a complicated, it's a good question, and I kind of expanded on it a little bit, maybe a little too much but it's going to create a dilemma for the Biden administration. How do I support Muhammad bin Salman and make him the liberalizer that he could be while still looking the other way as he violates human rights, not just in his country, but in the countries around him. It's a major issue that the Biden administration is kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. The best solution that I can give him and the one that looks like he's doing is performative gestures, performative sanctions, right? Saying that he will sanction uh, Saudi's, uh, Saudi Arabia's, uh, that he will not sell weapons to Saudi Arabia that will allow them to do certain things in Yemen, but making sure that someone will sell the weapons to Saudi Arabia. So the US will technically performatively sanction Saudi Arabia, but through Israel, it will get the weapons that it needs. The US did the exact same thing with Azerbaijan a few months ago in fought Nagorno-Karabakh. Technically, Azerbaijan is under US sanctions, and so they got it from Israel. Uh, the use of a proxy state. That's another issue that Israel is needed for the US administration. So we, I expect to see a lot of performative sanctions in this uh, region while making sure that the interests of the US are still being kept and, and um, MBS is kept strong. Okay, well, thank you, Eli. You know, there's still a lot of people on very interested. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe we'll have a follow on or something like that. We'll we'll see if people we will you will all be getting a survey. So we'll ask people to fill it out. And uh, maybe uh, in the coming year, we'll have another uh, time to ask more questions. I'm going to share um, so that people can see uh, that these are our sponsors. So thank you so much to the Atlanta Israel Coalition, Lee Tannenbaum, who has been helping us immensely. She's, they sponsored this webinar. We really appreciate it. And they helped us all the way along. So thank you so much, Lee and the uh, Atlanta Israel Coalition. We want to thank Amenu, the Israel American Council, the Congregation B'nai Amuna, Washington University, and the uh, St. Louis J as part of the Zionism 3.0. There'll be more programs coming up later in the year, so please keep uh, uh, looking at that. And again, you could go to stlouisfriendsofisrael.com to, and we'd love a donation, but you could also find out more about other programs. In addition to that, um, you don't forget this coming uh, Thursday, it, come for our drive-in event. It's gonna be a lot of fun. That's gonna, do not miss it. 
register there at iac360.org uh, event, CI-STL. It's, it's a celebration happening around the country. And also um, Atlanta is, is sponsoring this uh, virtual tours of Israel. You can sign up for that. So you will see these on our Facebook and our webpage. So please thank you all. And we really appreciate in addition to our sponsors, all of you who came and joined and stayed. Uh, and uh, yes. uh, Eli, we, we love your lectures. We You always add so much more depth and perspective and it's, it's very much appreciated. And we know that you will be, uh, although your term is ending, uh, we hopefully will see you in, in St. Louis um, for many other opportunities. Again, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Eli and Philip, for the questions. Uh, and I'm sorry I couldn't answer all of the questions, but I will do. I will follow up as Bob said. And thank you all for staying so long. All right. Good night, Lila Tov, or I should say Boker Tov. Good morning. Boker Tov. Yeah. Yom Atzmoot Sameach. Yom Atzmoot Sameach to everyone. Have a very good have Independence Day. All right. Bye bye.